Okay, hello and welcome to the next in our series of wine webinars. Uh, this evening we are looking at Discover Tokai. Uh, we are very happy to be back. This is our first event of 2021. Uh, nice to be back with you again and I hope you are looking forward to an interesting session. Um, so just a bit about uh, WCT School London to start with. Hopefully uh, you are aware of who we are and that you're here. Um, we are uh, the flagship um, qualification provider for the WSET. We have our uh, building in London Bridge where we'd normally be teaching all of our courses. Um, but once again, we're in lockdown. So no more classroom courses, um, but it gives us an opportunity to get back online uh, and bring you something a bit different today. Um, so with me tonight, we have Anna Maria. Uh, who is going to be taking you through all the intricacies of Tokai. Um, Anna Maria is a diploma alumna, um, so some of you I know will be stud studying diploma already, others uh, may be considering it. Um, she lives in Budapest currently and is uh, a sommelier as well as a wine consultant and a wine educator, uh, so multifaceted uh, in the wine world there. Um, I will let her take over from here um, and yeah, just pop any questions you have in the Q&A and we'll get to those at the end. Thanks very much. Thank you, Julia. So welcome everyone. It's an absolute uh, delight and ple pleasure to see so many people from all over the world and uh, a special um, delight to be able to host a webinar here for WSET School London, where I actually completed uh, my, the diploma myself. And um, hopefully I'll be able to uh, show you uh, sort of slightly more in depth or different view on uh, Tokai other than what you can find in the textbooks and uh, Wikipedia. Uh, so we will not really be focusing on uh, winemaking per se and sugar levels, et cetera, uh, but a little bit looking behind um, sort of why uh, Tokai is such a complex wine region and so special. Uh, in the world of wine. Uh, hopefully you have a glass of Tokai with you. Uh, please do share if you do and uh, share what you are drinking in the chat. And we will be tasting what well, I will be tasting some wines. Uh, let me know if you actually manage to source the same wines and what you think of them. And uh, for the first 45 minutes, I will be um, talking a little bit about history, geology, grape varieties, and um, other interesting facts relating to this wonderful wine region. So, um, uh, so a little bit of, of an overview of Tokai. Uh, so we are in the northeast of Hungary. Actually, you can see it on the map on the next slide where we are. Um, and uh, just south of the Zemplain Mountains, uh, which provides a sort of cooling effect um, to, to the vineyards here. And uh, it's very important, there's a huge influence of two uh, main rivers in the area, Tisza and Bodrog, uh, which, is, which are um, sort of modulating the, uh, the weather and the humidity, and also are essential to the development of uh, botrytis or noble rot. Um, just a little bit of a few facts as well about the climate. So 600 millimeter average annual rainfall, about uh, 13 and a half Celsius average annual temperature and uh, just under 2000 hours of sunshine per year. Also, there's quite, it's, uh, being located in the north of the country, uh, it's quite a cool uh, continental climate. So um, there are a huge di diurnal ranges in temperature uh, between night and day, uh, which helps as well with the ripening of the grapes. Uh, so one of the, um, pillars of complexity of Tokai is that it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's got volcanic soil. Uh, so it goes back to sort of 20 million years uh, old volcanic activity that carried on um, up until about um, 50,000 years ago. And, uh, it's, and it created all these layers um, of different uh, volcanic soils. Um, and basically uh, due to tectonic plate activity, uh, convergent tectonic plate activity where uh, tectonic plates approach each other as opposed to sort of getting away from each other. 
um, this created all these volcanic eruptions, but 350 extinct volcanoes exist in the Tokai Hedioea wine region. And there's also some alluvial components. So all this uh, volcanic activity was actually underneath uh, the Pannonian Sea. Um, so as the volcanoes erupted, uh, they sort of created this layer of volcanic um, soil and geology. And then uh, from the sea, uh, some sediments uh, formed on top. And then again, with volcanic activity, there was another layer of uh, volcanic um, soil. So, so, so it's very sort of like a sandwich-like um, structure. And uh, the main grapes in the area are furmint, which accounts for about 60% of the uh, plant plantations, hash levelu, which is more or less about 30%, and the rest is Sharga uh, Muskotai, uh, Zeta, Kabar, and Kövér Szörnő. As about, not about, eight different wine styles are produced, so this adds to the versatility and the uh, complexity of the region. And uh, it's very um, um, sort of uh, divided in terms of the areas. There's 18,000 different parcels, an average size of about 0 0.3 hectares. And uh, the average um, actual winery size is only half a hectare. So there's only about 15 larger producers who, who have uh, larger holdings. And um, it's still a lot, it's a lot of uh, farmers who farm on a, a sort of around half a hectare a sized vineyards and then actually sell their grapes to, um, to, to winemakers. Uh, so here you can see the Zamplain Mountains on the on the north, uh, which is the sort of green color, and then the rivers on the south. Um, and uh, in terms of history, uh, Tokai has got a lot to offer, very, very complex, got real rich historical background. Um, the actually, first archaeolo archaeological evidence for winemaking uh, goes back to uh, Roman times, so about third century AD. Uh, and from the 14th century, they actually started uh, focusing on uh, naturally sweet winemaking. Uh, so yeah, very, very long tradition. And uh, the first, uh, there's been a lot of different classifications of Tokai vineyards. The first is uh, 1450 by uh, Janos Hunyadi, uh, where they, they basically divided the styles of wine um, from, uh, for up to these uh, different categories that you can see there. Uh, so Venum Magnum, Venum Medium, Venum uh, Minor. And until the 19th century, there's actually been 17 different classifications. Um, in terms of um, the sort of uprise of Tokai um, as a winemaking region came from the middle end of the 15th century. Uh, where there's been free uh, trade deals and then um, subsequently elimination of tax payments for Osu grapes. So it really sort of helped to propel um, winemaking, sweet winemaking in Tokai. And then um, in 1700, uh, there was uh, the most famous classification by a prince and the landowner called uh, Rapoci Ferenc II. And he was helped by uh, Bill Mákyás, uh, Mákyás Bill, to, uh, to make these classifications. It's actually uh, 56 years before the first demarcation of the Douro Valley and quite a long time before uh, the Bordeaux uh, classification. So, um, so yeah, it's a pioneering region in terms of uh, classifying its vineyards as well as uh, the wines themselves. In the 1800s, um, Actually, yeah, there's an interesting story from the early so 1703, uh, Marshal de Krakowski, so this prince, he sends uh, some Tokai Oslo to uh, uh, King Louis XIV in France, and uh, they're really taken aback by this wine. It starts to spread all over uh, Europe in the aristocracy and uh, um, kings and queens, and, uh, and apparently it's Louis XIV who um, basically uh, labels uh, Tokai as uh, Vinum Regum Rex Vinorum, so wine of the king and king of the wines. <clears throat> so it's already very popular all across Europe. And, uh, and then in, eight, in the 1800s, uh, there's a lot of Jewish people moving in uh, from um, 
surrounding countries who are very successful at making tokoyosu and trading it. So this again um, is actually a very good time for sweet tokoy wines. Then from there on, there's a lot, a uh, lot of difficulties, uh, which actually, um, in my opinion, Tokoi has only started to recover from in the last uh, sort of 30 years. Uh, so first, uh, Philoxera hit uh, Tokoi in 1855. Um, then uh, obviously it's World War One, and then the Great Depression and World War Two. Uh, so uh, first of all, the devastation by Philoxera, then. Uh, they replant, replanted the vineyards, uh, but production um, severely decreased um, in, the, in the, first, um, uh, the first and the second world war. And then just as the second world war finished, and you know, most of Western Europe could start sort of developing uh, the winemaking and vineyards, uh, we had 50 years of a communist era, uh, which uh, really started focusing on um, not quality of winemaking, but rather quantity. Um, so they, um, they were using um, lesser um, uh, value or, you know, sort of flatter lands uh, for grape growing, which are easier to be mechanized and easier to, to be made um, into, um, you know, like a sort of lower quality, but a larger quantity of, uh, of tokoi. So this uh, sort of carried on for 50 years. So until eight, 1989, 1990, when finally uh, communism ended in Hungary and uh, wineries uh, started to get privatized um, from um, a lot, you know, a lot of uh, foreign investors actually um, came into Hungary as well. So Axel Milazim, for example, um, and, uh, and also some traditional winemaking families um, actually um, started to buy more land and, and take winemaking seriously again. Uh, so also since 2002, uh, Tokoi Hedyo is a, a UNESCO World Heritage Site um, to sort of um, um, put into, uh, put into um, focus of how important history and uh, the history of winemaking is um, in this area of the world. So yeah, historically, a lot of ups and downs, uh, very complex. And uh, in my opinion, it's only sort of, we just started uh, in Tokai um, not so long ago. So there's still a lot of um, uh, development ahead and exciting times ahead. Uh, but also another, uh, another area of complexity is its uh, grapes and styles. Uh, so in terms of the grapes, um, actually, food mint is the main grape variety. Uh, which was, uh, it's, it's really intertwined with the geology of the region uh, because Furmint is quite, um, hot, it tolerates acidic soils quite well. It likes this volcanic uh, soil and actually it's quite high vigor. So it needs um, really um, poor soils to, to thrive and to not, not to be too vigorous and to produce uh, good quality fruit for winemaking. Um, and um, it's often blended with hash levelu. Uh, hash levelu is uh, slightly more disease resistant. It ripens uh, a lot earlier and it adds a sort of floral, aromatic, spicy character because uh, food mint is not really aromatic at all. It's a more sort of austere, uh, austere uh, style of wine. And uh, food mint is also susceptible to disease. So powdery and uh, downy mildew, also virus uh, that destroys the, the roots of the wine esca, is uh, susceptible to frost damage. Uh, so it's not very easy to work with it, but uh, it's really suitable for the soils and the geology of um, Tokai. And uh, there's another really important uh, fact about Fall Mint is, uh, of course, to make these beautiful, uh, naturally sweet wines you need a grape that can accumulate sugar and uh, acidity uh, and retain acidity at the same time as accumulating sugar. And as uh, four mint is excellent for that. Also hash level has got a similar characteristic. And uh, so Toko is most famous for its sweet wines and you probably all know Osu, it's really well known worldwide. Perhaps you know about Samorodny. And then also late harvest styles are quite popular as well. Um, being able to um, 
to offer a, a Tokai wine for a um, um, sort of a more affordable uh, price. And uh, Asu is just, so I'm just going to give a, like a little overview of uh, Asu Samarodni styles without, without going into the detail of how exactly they are made. Uh, however, my email address is on the top of the chat. So if anybody uh, perhaps has any questions about um, anything that we, we might be just mentioning in passing, I'm very happy to, um, to uh, provide an answer through my email. Uh, so with ASU, um, the minimum residual sugar content is 120 grams per litre. Um, there used to be uh, three and four putonyosh as well. well. Currently it's only five and six putonyosh ASU um, is uh, produced. Although you can declassify your five putonyosh to three putonyosh if you like, but the the minimum required sugar content is now the same for three, four, and five putonyosh, uh, which is 120 grams per liter. For six putonyosh, it's a minimum of 150 grams per liter. Um, but often it really exceeds this uh, by uh, quite a lot. Uh, so um, uh, the aging requirement is minimum two years with uh, 18 months in barrel. And uh, Osu wines are very, very long lived, very concentrated, and uh, you, they give you lots of layers of sort of dried fruit and apricot and with aged mushrooms and honey and nuts and all these wonderful, wonderful flavors. It's probably the most complex or the most complex uh, from Tokai wines. And then Samorodni is a, a slightly less sweet style and it's more flexible in terms of winemaking. A minimum 45 grams of re residual sugar for Sweden. There's also a dry style of Samorodny, which is nine grams maximum per liter. Uh, I would love to tell you about all the details of how these wines are made, but unfortunately 45 minutes would not be enough. Uh, so for Samorodny, slightly less aging uh, requirement, and you usually get a sort of more fresh fruit uh, aromas, more sort of mango and peach and less nutty characters. Um, and uh, it has a real um, sort of renaissance, I think, or it's, it's starting to uh, become more and more popular in restaurants for wine pairings with sommeliers uh, because uh, the price is slightly lower than of ossels and it's easier to sort of open it and serve it by the glass or to pair it with desserts that are not super, super sweet. Uh, for late harvest, there's no aging requirement and there's a special category called Essentia uh, which is a minimum of 450 grams of residual sugar per liter, but it often uh, goes up to eight, 900 grams. Basically, Essencia is just the grape juice that sort of drips out of the Osu berries while they are being collected. So it's like um, nectar. Very, very special if you have the chance uh, to try it. Um, so just to give you an idea of how these grapes look and uh, because uh, for, to achieve uh, um, botrytis levels uh, that are uh, suitable for making osu, uh, you can see on the bottom right corner uh, the osu berries. So, so it has to be completely, completely shriveled uh, in order to, to give you um, uh, grapes that, are, um, that are, are good enough to make uh, osu wines. Uh, dry wines are completely healthy grapes. Late harvest, you can see they start to shrivel a little bit and somewhat oddly they still have a little bit of juice in, uh, but they're not completely uh, raisinated. And you can see on this, on the left picture, actually the bottom, uh, bottom grape uh, that is not that shriveled, that would be uh, actually not used for us. All the rest of the berries could be. So this is why Osu is also very expensive because you need to pick the Osu berries one by one. Um, whereas with Samoroni, you can just basically pick a uh, part of the bunch or even the whole bunch with some Osu berries. Uh, but yeah, you get a lot more flexibility. Um, so, uh, Botrytis scenario is noble rot. And um, I actually read this, um, uh, a while ago, someone um, likened it to the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde of winemaking, which I, I really like this. Uh, so I thought I'd share it with you. So it's actually 
genetically identical to uh, gray rot, so it's a fungi. Um, and there's been so, some studies looking at it, whether they're really genetically uh, identical, and, and they actually are. Um, it needs uh, very specific weather conditions to, to spread in the vineyard, so quite like sort of misty, uh, humid conditions, but with uh, warm afternoons. However, if you get uh, grey rot in your vineyard, uh, most of the time, sort of 90% of the time, it's unwanted and you will lose your crop. Uh, however, for us, we really want this to happen. So you, you, you want the uh, grey rot to spread right at the end of October, sort of, uh, or throughout October, because without that, you will not be getting those beautiful raisinated berries. So yeah, it can be devastating most of the time, but sometimes it just gives you these beautiful uh, nectar um, if it comes where, where, when you want it to come. Um, so the best vintages for us, I thought I'd just collect it for you. Uh, 2000, 2003, 2007, which is a little bit warm, but still gave good quality ossules. 8, 13, 17, and 19. So you can see in the last 20 years, uh, there's only been seven outstanding vintages. Um, so it's not only um, very risky uh, to wait for this botrytis to happen on the grapes, because it might not happen, or it might not happen in the right way. You might lose all your crop. Um, it's, uh, it's also um, quite rare uh, in terms of vintages that it happens. And then uh, you can see here the um, sort of evolution from the healthy, uh, little bit overripe grape berry until right at the end, we can see the, the botrytized ossu berries. Um, and then I just thought I'd just give you a little bit of a geeky um, side of uh, what happens inside the grape uh, when a botrytis attacks it. Uh, so another sort of literature, literary um, uh, example for this is a sort of Romeo and Juliet of um, uh, the winemaking. So basically they start, they start they, when the uh, noble rot starts to attack the berries, which you can see on the, so the healthy berries on the top with green. Now, as you can see, the noble rot starts to attack the berry on the first um, picture. And then as it sort of uh, proceeds to, to stage two, stage three, and stage four, uh, it sort of sucks the life out of the berry. And then by the time you achieve a complete botrytization, uh, they both die uh, at the same time. Uh, so the grape and the fungus as well. It's a little bit romantic, I suppose. Um, so, um, so yeah, there's the sweet styles, uh, which actually uh, the pre, like for example, Ossu only accounts for five percent by volume and fifteen percent by value uh, to to the whole of uh, wine product for the whole of wine uh, production in Tokai. And uh, dry styles are on the rise, uh, first of all because of econ economical um, sort of viability. Um, the vintage variations, it's, it's more and more important that winemakers can, uh, do have something to fall back to. As well, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful style of wine uh, produced from Formin. But um, yeah, it has a, a huge importance uh, for the future of Tokai. So it actually really increased since 2003 when it was 4% of the total uh, wine production. Uh, right now, it accounts for uh, just over 20% of the total wine production. Mm, and the experimentation with dry styles began in the sort of early mid 90s, but the first sort of milestone cited by many in the region is the uh, uh, 2000 vintage of uh, Kirai Udvar Uradja Furmint, uh, which is had about still about um, 11, 12 uh, grams per liter residual sugar, but it was the first, uh, of course, piercing acidity. So that sort of balanced it out. And it still is perceivable as a, as a dry wine. And uh, then from there on, a lot more uh, wineries started experimenting with uh, dry styles of poor mint. So Sepshi was a winery that contributed hugely uh, to the development of dry styles. And, um, and right now it's uh, gaining uh, more and more market share and abroad as well as uh, 
in um, Hungary. So uh, from uh, so okay, so we looked at the uh, the difference in styles, the array of styles, um, the um, little bit about geology, but actually geology is um, the most uh, the biggest contributing factor to the complexity of of the region. So on average, about fifty million years old geological structures are uh, present here. We mentioned these sandwich-like volcanic and alluvial layers. Uh, actually, it started about 20 million uh, years ago in the Miocene um, era, epoch. And uh, so this volcanic uh, geoheritage is very important here. Um, so we have rhyolite, anthracite, uh, perlite, trachyte, basalt, zeolite, all their tuffs as well. The tuff is basically um, this lighter consistency um, magma that comes uh, that comes up from a volcano just after the gases um, and um, before the sort of main um, component of the, uh, for example, rhyolite. Uh, rhyolite tuff will be the first to, to, to exit the volcano during an eruption. Mm, and often, uh, the, so you would have um, um, a lot of variation in the um, geology. You'd have some vineyards that would have some alluvial um, uh, cover on top of these volcanic uh, subsoils, uh, so loess um, or marl even. But uh, sometimes you have uh, basically just um, crumbled um, textures of these uh, of these volcanic soils. So it's very very versatile. Sort of every 15, 20 meters, um, you can have a completely different soil composition, with, which really adds to the complexity of a. Uh, making wine in this in this region. Uh, generally, mostly it's low pH so, uh, soils, uh, which are well suited for food mint. But uh, and in the areas where there's a lot of loose, um, you get a slightly higher uh, pH as well. And there's a picture here of like a volcanic hill to demonstrate uh, uh, sort of the um, shapes and forms that you uh, uh, that you uh, come across when you're in Tokai. And uh, just in the background there, you can see uh, Kirai Dulu, uh, which is one of the um, sort of highest uh, classified uh, um, vineyards in Tokai, in the uh, Mad uh, region. And uh, so slightly, a little bit more geeky facts for you. So just uh, to look at how you can see another aspect of the geological diversity. Uh, this is actually a 35 hectare uh, vineyard called Sarvas Dulu. And it's an image of uh, this uh, normalized difference vegetation index. Um, so it's basically what it tells you is how much photosynthesis synthesis is happening in each uh, separate area. Um, so the uh, so green, yellow, and red shows a higher photosynthesis and uh, sort of blue and uh, purple and brown uh, colors show lower levels of photosynthesis. So this is all connected to um, the water retention capabilities of the soil and, uh, and obviously how, how nutrient dense the soil is. Um, so it's just, I think, a beautiful demonstration of even within one, uh, vineyard of 35 hectares, how many different types of soil um, you can observe, which, which adds uh, hugely to the complexity of chain, you know, choosing your rootstocks and uh, your clones and um, uh, making uh, many other uh, decisions in, in uh, viticulture. Mm, climate and weather is another factor that is really worth mentioning. Of course, it's not unique to Tokai. It's everywhere in the world, um, but even the, in Tokai as well, global warming has contributed uh, um, for a, quite a few changes in the last 10 years alone. Temperature, average temperature has gone up by uh, one and a half degrees Celsius, although there are some years that are really, really unusually cold. So there's just a lot of variation. It's more of weather is more erratic and um, the pattern of rainfall is changing. So it's first of all, 
uh, very a lot lower than it was sort of 10 years ago it was 600 millimeters which i mentioned uh before and uh and now in the last 10 years it's, it's uh, often 200 millimeters less uh, so it could be 350 400 450 um so this is um it's prompted a lot of uh, research into uh into uh clonal selection rootstocks and uh looking at how um, how the region can adapt to these challenges. Um, so it's definitely um, contributing um, as well to uh, complexity of the region. Um, and also um, we see, um, you know, sort of trends as well in, uh, in wine consumption that are, you know, making it a little bit tricky uh, for Tokai, uh, sweet styles with, you know, high sugar content wines are a little bit fallen out of fashion. Uh, so this is one of the uh, other reasons why uh, it's very important to, uh, to be able to produce a substantial percentage uh, of, of dry styles as well. And um, actually about 85% um, of um, Tokai uh, wine production is uh, like semi-sweet uh, in style. Um, so it's not 75% and 20% dry and then only 5% um, 5% uh, Osu, Osu styles. Um, yeah, actually, yeah, I can see as well a lot of questions here. Very happy to answer. You can email me as well or put them in, in the Q&A. Um, so uh, in terms of marketing and communication, there's quite a few challenges as well. Uh, to communicate, you know, to, to mar establish markets abroad that um, uh, Toka is not just about sweet wine, it's not just about Osu, but there's actually uh, a lot of other interesting styles. So this is actually happening, especially in the UK. Um, there is uh, more and more interest and curiosity towards uh, dry styles of uh, poor mint, especially. And um, and also, yeah, we can't forget that it's a relatively young um, uh, wine making history in terms of the modern, the modern times. So it's only 30 years ago that uh, we had the freedom or winemakers had the freedom to, um, to actually start to make quality wines again. So uh, there's a lot of experimentation happening in terms of geology and uh, the different aspects of poor mint and hash value. Um, and um, there's a lot of, uh, because it's quite a young, modern uh, winemaking era, there's still a lot of differing views in the region and many, many different styles of wines are produced. Uh, so a lot of uh, producers would leave a bit of residual sugar to balance out the uh, piercing acidity in the wines. Um, there are some winemakers who make bone dry wines and, and they, uh, they use a lot of oak. Um, so yeah, you can find even within dry full mint, so such an array of different styles, which is a very exciting, um, exciting time uh, for the region. Uh, so yeah, to uh, conclude, um, Tokai has a really, really rich uh, history, and uh, which uh, you know can be inspired by and uh, really great uh, potential. To, uh, to show the many faces of, of Ford Mint. Um, and uh, the complexity in terms of geology is, is great to express terroir. And there's been a, a really increase in um, terroir driven, you know, single vineyard wines being released to the market. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting for that. And uh, yeah, there is a quite a, long uh, road ahead still uh, with a relatively young modern history <clears throat> but there has been a, a lot of investment into uh, research in recent years to better understand uh, the soil for example so you know we do know there is that there is huge variation in soils and there's all these different volcanic layers uh, but we don't really have a lot of studies looking at this um, on a sort of global scale in the region. So yeah, we have a lot of partial information, 
uh, but yeah, we, we, it's, it's very difficult to, to actually get a, a full picture of what's going on underneath the, the, the topsoil and, and a little bit below. And there's also sustainable viticulture is, is gaining um, uh, popularity. A lot of wineries are already biodynamic or organic or starting to uh, uh, move towards that, which I think is, is quite interesting and exciting. And uh, there has been some exciting um, news as well about the uh, DNA uh, parentage of a uh, formint. Um, it's about eight years ago uh, when wine grapes was released, uh, they still, uh, the only thing we knew is that it's one of its parents is Gouet Blanc, which is also a parent of Chardonnay and many other European uh, wine uh, grape varieties. And uh, that it has a parent offspring relationship with Hash Levelu, which we, since we found out that actually Hash Levelu is the offspring. So we are still looking for the other parent, but there has been some um, uh, interesting um, uh, studies lately, some archaeobiological archae studies uh, looking at uh, potential um, parentage of forward mint uh, originating from Georgia, perhaps. Uh, so that's something that should um, hopefully uh, give us some more information in 2021. And uh, yeah, I think uh, pretty much covered everything that I wanted a um, little bit sooner than I thought. So we have a little bit more time to, to talk about these wineries. As I've chosen four different wines for you to showcase the um, uh, the versatility and of the of the region. So as we mentioned before, we have eight different styles. So, so it's quite a, a lot. So we have sparkling wines in Toko, we have dry styles, we have uh, off dry, semi-sweet, we have lusciously sweet. Um, we also have some other, uh, we, ha we have somewhat oddly dry and sweet. <laughs> we have also uh, two different um, methods of uh, making wine from the pressed uh, osu berries, which is called mashlash and forditash, where you actually add some more base wine, sort of like water it down, or like after you use the osu berries, you, you add some more wine, uh, which has got um, its roots in, in communism. But you know, some people are still making these wines. So it's just so many styles uh, to choose from. Uh, but I thought I would choose um, First of all, uh, sparkling, which is, is quite rare to find uh, in Tokai, um, from a quite um, historic and very, very important winery um, in Tokai. And, uh, and then the three different wines from the same vintage, 2017, which was a really outstanding vintage in Tokai, all for dry and for sweet styles as well. Um, so Kira Udwar is... Uh, a winery that was found in 1999 by Anthony Huang, uh, who's also the owner of uh, Domaine Huyé in uh, Vouvray. And, uh, you know, his influence is really apparent on the styles of wine. So in the dry uh, styles, they have a sec and a demi-sec. And then also this um, sparkling is, is made in a little bit of a sort of a pétillant approach. So not too much uh, pressure only about four bars and uh, it's made from 70% four mint and 30% hash level. The winemaker is uh, Samuel Shiuhas and uh, they've been making this wine for since 2007. They actually like to age them for quite a lot before uh, disgorging, uh, age on lease, so this has had 22 months, but actually the 2017 vintage is still on the lease so that's going to get um, over three years on the lease. And uh, why I really like them as well, personally, because they actually keep their wines um, for quite a long time before they release them to the market. And they release them to the market when they think that they are perfectly ready for the market. And they hold back quite a large stock as well from uh, different vintages to see how they develop. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, had spontaneous fermentation. They uh, they basically ferment all their base wines or all their wines 
in a used barrel, so they can be anything from 10 to 15 years old. Um, and, um, and all their wines have this sort of um, textural richness and a lot of layers. Um, so yeah, if you can get them uh, in your country, I definitely recommend it to try their wines. Uh, they also make uh, sweet wines as well. And uh, I put the UK retailer at the bottom of each slide. Um, so in the UK, it's imported by Indigo Wines. And I also managed to find a few bottles um, on the Drinks & Co website. Uh, the sparkling is quite um, difficult to uh, get hold of abroad. But if you can, then you should definitely try it. So I thought I'd try it with you. So cheers if you're having a glass of wine. It's got a, a lot of uh, sort of this sort of ginger, shortbread and ripe citrus character. I think it would uh, really stand up um, very good to um, a lot of foods. It's slightly like slightly oxidative, but in a, in a good way. Um, so sort of this um, ethyl-y, um, Quincy character is, is really apparent. Show you the bottle. So the bottle is actually the same as what you can see on the label there. So I'll show you the bottle. They are very fine, elegant bubbles and um, a lot of structure and, and richness in the flavor, highly recommended. So this is from the uh, Henya vineyard, single um, vineyard, uh, but yeah, with, from two different grapes. And uh, then the next wine is um, a food mint from uh, Homona Attila. So Kirayudwar, I believe they are farming around 35 to 40 hectares at the moment. So it's sort of medium sized uh, winery. Uh, Homonna is uh, on a smaller side, so about three and a half hectares. And, uh, and he makes mainly dry wines, a little bit of uh, sweet, uh, osu very rarely. Uh, so he's, um, yeah, he, he usually makes two single vineyard dry formins. And then also um, um, an estate, a couple of estate blends as well. So it was the winery is called Homona, and the winemaker is Attila Homona. So he founded the winery in 1999 in Erdubene, and uh, which is uh, sort of northwest of Tokai town. Because Tokai is actually, a, I haven't mentioned who's the Tokai is actually a town as well, as well as a region. And the wine from Tokai is called Tokai with an I at the end. So, and I, I, I believe it can be quite confusing um, for some. So this, uh, this uh, wine is made biodynamically. Um, so they only use uh, sort of copper sulfate and orange oil, just biodynamic preparations and uh, uh, all the, um, it's not certified, but yeah, they do all the winery viticultural and uh, winemaking operations according to the biodynamic calendar. So this one is 100% uh, for me. And uh, yeah, it's a, sort of, Attila has a sort of very laissez-faire attitude to winemaking. So everything ferments uh, spontaneously. He uses a uh, absolutely minimum amount of sulfur and uh, yeah, super low intervention uh, approach. And he uses 50% stainless steel and 50% used oak. Uh, so the wines never have an oaky uh, sort of wood flavors. Uh, it just adds to the texture. The acidity is usually quite high in his wines and, uh, and they are usually uh, fermented to uh, almost complete dryness. Mm, so um, let's try this one. Ran is actually, he also has a vineyard called Hotari. Um, Hotari wines tend to, if you have a chance to try them, they, are, they tend to be ready a little bit sooner. And they're more, more sort of juicy, fruity, and um, Ran usually takes about a year longer to develop. It's more a, a stair um, kind of um, ornament. So I'll show you this bottle as well, although it's the same as on the presentation. So 
yeah, this wine is a um, very sort of citrus, skin driven, really fresh, high acidity. And it has great potential to, to evolve even for another 10 years in the bottle easily. Um, and the acidity, this acidic backbone is always a signature um, the style of Attila. We've got a little bit of leasiness, a um, little bit of this textural richness, but it's a very fresh um, style, the medium, full bodied, but performing. Uh, it's quite citrus driven, with a lot of freshness to it. And then the next one is actually a Samorodni, as I've mentioned before. Uh, Samorodni, with Samorodni, have a lot more flexibility in terms of uh, how it's made compared to Asu. Uh, it's a lot more sort of consumer friendly in terms of the price point and the style. Generally, um, lower uh, sugar levels than with Asu, but ca it can easily sorry it can easily be a lot higher so this one is 204 grams uh, which is uh you know it's, it's it's not a rare occurrence so uh this uh, wine was made by picking it's from bomboy uh, vineyard which is quite a high elevation in tokai um so about 300 yeah 295 meters elevation and uh um, this is really good for Samorodni because um, os like Osu berries and botrytis tends to um, tends to be more apparent in slightly lower situated uh, vineyards, sort of like slightly lower, maybe than 300, uh, where the, um, the fog and um, the humidity is strapped a little bit more. So the high altitude, get more air going through. So um, Somewhat only, which is not made from fully botrytized berries, this is really good. So uh, they picked basically half bunches twice, I think, for this one. Um, and uh, these half bunches contained uh, some level of botrytization, but they still have this beautiful freshness and acidity uh, from the healthy berries that are also mixed in. And then they, um, they pressed the uh, grapes. And they basically, uh, they leave it to sort of infuse with the uh, berries uh, for about an, one night, 12 hours, to just get a little bit more extraction. And then they vinify it um, without, without the actual, um, um, os the grapes themselves, <clears throat> the whole grapes. Um, so 12% um, alcohol, acidity is, yeah, you definitely need that level of acidity to support this amount of residual sugar and um, let's taste the wine. Just um, a lot of uh, peach, a bit of, uh, of tropical fruit aromas and a little bit of creme caramel. It's just uh, the ideas that come to my mind for pairing are, you know, very uh, versatile. It's perfectly balanced between the um, sugar and the acid intensity of fruit. And actually, this wine has just uh, about a month ago um, got selected into um, the 15 best uh, wines or wines of the year by Decanter for 2020, which is a great achievement. So if you can get your hands on it, I would definitely recommend to try this. To try this wine. So someone's mentioning the Wines of Hungary website is not working. Um, I don't know, it was working for me just yesterday, but um, yeah, drop me an email later and I can I can help you with that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, again, 2017, it's a brilliant uh, vintage. So I thought I'd just mentioned that actually um, uh, Istvan Balasha, the winemaker, he made, um, I believe six, we have seven uh, single vineyard summer Um So uh, that's a really exceptional, exceptional uh, vintage for uh, for everyone in, in Tokai. And um, he actually owns 2.71 hectares from this Bomboy vineyard where it's from, Bomboy Samarodni. Um, 
Bomboy is the largest uh, single vineyard in Tokai with its uh, nearly 90 hectares. Um, and uh, yeah, it's beautiful summer, isn't it? Try it if you can. And then moving on to the last wine. So I thought you know, I couldn't uh, show you wines without showing you uh, Six Boutonnes Asu. Uh, so Sebshi is the uh, one of the leading and most um, sort of historical and influential uh, wineries in Tokai. They have been making wine, it's family owned, and uh, the Sebshi family has been making wine for uh, uh, over 500 years. And uh, they were pioneers from a lot of different perspectives in Tokai. And they were the first one to, bring, to begin a green harvest, for example, which is pretty much unheard of uh, before uh, 1990. Uh, they actually do three uh, rounds of green harvest on average. Um, so uh, yeah, they, they work with um, um, really, really uh, low uh, no amount of grape per, per vine. And um, they also pioneered on many other fronts. So as I mentioned already, uh, with the white uh, dry uh, styles of uh, Tokai, where they were amongst the first uh, to, to experiment with it and to release the wines to the market. And uh, they practice sustainable viticulture, so not uh, organic or biodynamic, but they don't use any pesticides, herbicides, or fertilizers. And they actually develop their own yeast culture that they work with. And they don't use any enzymes, as ad additives, and also minimal level of sulfur. But you always find uh, quite a you know, prominent use of oak. So they use uh, um, new oak generally. So new or two, three years, one to three years old oaks from the Zemplain mountains. And uh, they, for the Asu, they, they leave the wines in the oak for 30 months. Um, and they all, for their dry wines, they, all, they always ferment the wines to complete bone dryness. Um, so, um, yeah, a very different style, for example, from Homona or some other, even from uh, Balasha's uh, dry, dry wines. So yeah, if you can try their dry wines, I definitely recommend it as well. Uh, so this particular Asu, so it's a, it's a hot six boutonnes. Uh, they only make six boutonnes Asu, by the way. And slightly higher um, residual sugar, so 260 grams per liter, 10% um, alcohol. And uh, you can see that this is more, mostly formed 80% with 20% um, hash level. And they do have um, selection, a selection, a single vineyard selection from, um, from all these vineyards that you can see. Uh, sorry, I did put Dürk there, which is in Hungarian for vineyard. Uh, so um, Becek, Szent Tomás, Bányás, Danska, and Király Dürk uh, make up this wine. Um, 2017 uh, was... Uh, such a good year that they actually uh, just released their best Tokai Asu six Putonyos to date, according to them, uh, from Becek and Saint Tomás Dulo, which has just uh, been released to the market. Um, so yeah, definitely recommend to try those as well. So these are the sort of estate uh, Asu. Uh, so sort of someone it was asking how much, uh, how much these wines cost. Mm. So I don't know exactly, but uh, generally the Kirai Udvar would retail perhaps for about 30 to 40 UK pounds. For Mona, probably the same. Uh, for Asha would be around 40 UK pounds. And Sepshi Asu is, I think it's more closer to about 80. So they're all quite... Um, you know, in the premium segment. So uh, this also is still quite young, still quite fresh. It, it gives you all the sort of um, uh, peach and apricot, but mainly apricot and orange rind and orange marmalade aromas that you would expect. And uh, sort of more white or golden raisins than, uh, than what you get from, from longer aging. Um, 
a lot of layers. And real marks, floral sort of jasmine um, aroma on the finish as well. Um, so yeah, it's no wonder that this um, style of wine is the is the crown in the pyramid of of Tokai winemaking. Um, so yeah, I hope that I have given you some ideas of you know how um, colorful Tokai is and how many different styles of wine you can try. And I would really encourage you to. Uh, you know, go out there and try um, all these uh, amazing wines and, and make up your own mind about them. So um, we have about five minutes left, but I, I believe that um, we can uh, actually use this time for any questions that you may have had. Uh, I think this is pretty much the end, yeah. Um, so as all the contacts for WSET School London, and uh, I'm just going to look at the Q&A to see your questions. So I think I'm going to try to answer as many as I can. I hope the presentation was not too dry and geeky, but I just thought that, you know, I would try and um, include as much detail and data and facts um, about Tokai that are not usually written in the textbooks. And uh, yeah, as I said already, if you have any questions, if you need any guidance for materials, for reading materials or recommendations for wines, then please hit me up. So I'm going to try, start from the beginning, see how far we get. And uh, in about 15 minutes, I think we will stop. And if anybody, if I haven't managed to answer any other questions, I will answer them in writing. Uh, so uh, during the communism time, were the Tokai wines fortified? Um, yes, definitely they were. I mean, a lot of uh, things were done to Tokai wines that would be considered sacrilege today. Um, but actually fortification was, uh, um, you know, maybe not so much to increase the volume, but to sort of stabilize the wine. Uh, but actually fortification, I hope I'm correct in thinking this. I read this a while ago. Um, so if anyone knows otherwise, let me know. But up until 2000, uh, fortification was, was not illegal. So it's only then that it was um, made illegal. So yeah, a lot of things were done to Tokai wines. And, uh, um, you know, it's just a sort of shadowy time for uh, Tokai winemaking. It's a uh, mint of wine native to Hungary. and Okay. Julia Lambert is going. Okay. Is, uh, is Formint a wine native to Hungary and is it planted elsewhere in the world? And if so, to any success? So it does look like, uh, looking at uh, DNA analysis, that Formint is indeed grape writing native to Hungary. I mean, there are lots of sort of stories and legend, legends going around that it originates from Italy and uh, from other regions, but um, countries. But actually, it's quite strong evidence now that it, that it is native to Hungary. And then hopefully, as I mentioned before, um, in 2021, we should actually know more about the, the exact uh, parentage due to this study that's about to be published about it. Um, so yeah, in other countries, I um, mean, yes, it's planted in Slovakia. There are some plantings, I think, in South Africa. There are small plantings around sort of Central and, and Eastern Europe, Croatia as well, and uh, Slovakia, of course, which is, you know, historically used to be the same country as Hungary until the Trianon uh, Treaty, the Versailles Treaty. So, um, so it's also grown in, in, in the south part of, of Slovakia. But actually, there's a really good um, sort of historical overview in the uh, Jose Vujamos, uh book the wine grapes so i would recommend uh, to to read that as well There's a lot of good information uh, next question essencia uh, does not have aging requirements mm, so essencia is basically uh, it's a very special category uh, in terms of aging requirements uh, i don't believe there are 
uh, but most uh, wineries don't even release them to the market. So a lot of wineries actually keep their Essencia uh, to blend later, uh, to add to their uh, uh, six Puttoyos perhaps. Um, also, there is, there are, a lot of people are quite reluctant to release these wines because then Essencia would be their sort of top wine and uh, the focus would be moved from, um, from six Puttoyos Asu. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I don't believe uh, that there is an A. It's, it's very rare to even see it on the market. Um, I don't believe it has a specific aging requirement, but, but I will um, find out for you, actually, if you put in your email address, perhaps, then uh, I can get back to you on that. Is the increase in quality since the end of the communist period mainly because of improved viticulture or is it more in the wineries and improvements in barrels, equipment, etc. cetera? Um, so yeah, it's improved viticulture as well. So, you know, things like, um, you, know, you know, you lower yields, you know, green harvests, uh, um, you know, looking at um, old uh, vineyards that were perhaps uh, not utilized in the communist era because they were difficult to approach or mechanize. So they could only be, um, they could all, you know, they could only be worked by hand. So all these vineyards have been, not all, but a lot of them have been discovered. Uh, so actually the area where they plant vines um, is, is, is also, has, has changed a lot. And uh, in the wineries as well, of course, with modern winemaking, you know, do you have a, a lot better hygiene, you know, you have temperature control, um, you know, you have uh, cleaner cellars, um, because back in the day, a lot of, most of the wines were actually matured in uh, cellars, there's a huge cellar system underneath the whole of Tokai, the Tokai region, and, um, and there is this, um, um, you know, it's not very hygienic, to be honest, by modern standards. So, so yeah, equipment, of course, and, uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's been a, a whole overhaul. So, you know, quality over quantity and, and yes, definitely improved viticulture and uh, wineries technologically are a lot more advanced. And just with the focus of shifting from, qual from quantity to quality, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's in, in every area there has been improvement. What kind of barrels are being used for aging? Go to food bearing, how to store once opened. Um, so barrels uh, are generally Zamplin barrels or, or local cooperages in, um, in, in the Tokai area. Uh, but, you know, some people are using uh, Stockinger, um, yeah, or some people are using uh, barrels from France as well. So it's, it's a huge um, selection, you know, it depends on what the winemaker really wants to achieve in terms of flavor, texture, aging ability. Etc. Well, yeah, that's very good quality oak uh, from the Zamplin Mountains available. Go to for food pairing. Mm, it depends what style you're talking about. But I think Ford Mint in general is quite a, um, you know, it has, it's quite an intense wine, quite complex. Um, so definitely you can pair it with a more complex flavor. Is that most of the dry styles or you know, the dry wine that I pre presented today, uh, they, I wouldn't recommend it for aperitifs, sort of. It's more like, you know, you can pair them with more daring, complex um, uh, flavors. But I think for me, the go-to food pairing is what you love, you know, as the number one um, uh, perspective. And yeah, obviously that there are certain rules uh, for sweet wines and uh, sparkling wines that you'd like to avoid. Uh, but generally, yeah, as long as you enjoy it. I, I really like actually Tokoi Asu with savory things. So like, you know, like a really rich curry or some blue cheese or, you know, to sort of contrast it, the sweetness with something savory. How to store once opened, um, just like any other wine. So yeah, make sure this it's, it's in the fridge and uh, you try and avoid the contact with oxygen. Um, Recommendation about Tokai that one should have tried. It depends what you have tried, but I would definitely recommend to try at least these four 
different styles. So try, you know, sparkling, you know, may, if you can, if you have the opportunity, definitely try it, but try, you know, Samorodni and Asu, I think will give you quite a good uh, overlook on, on the diversity. What does the word Asu mean in Hungarian? Mm. So Asu Shodash, so it basically means the, uh, the drying out of the grapes. But the actual uh, sort of linguistic origins, I'm not too sure, but I can get back to you on that as well if you leave your email. Um, maybe leave it in the chat and then I can uh, give you some more in depth into information. Is there a dry Tokai wine you would recommend having never tried a dry style? What food would you pair it with? Um, it depends where you are. First of all, because availability for Tokai can be quite, you know, varied um, in the world. So, uh, but any, basically, try any. You can try Roy Royal Tokai. They have quite a lot of, um, you know, really good uh, dry styles that are widely available in the US and the UK as well. Uh, but you can try, you know, with an entry level and then, you know, experience how how that tastes, and then you know maybe if you like it, then move up um, to the to the next level. Um, what food would you pair it with? Uh, because of the acidity, I think uh, it goes really well with sort of fried foods. It goes really well with um, white meats or fish with even a sort of richer sauce. Um, so the, the acidity cuts through the richer sauce. Uh, but it still has substance to, to stand up to, to the flavors. But again, um, you know, it depends on the style. It could be oaky, it could be still fer fermented, it could be a really fresh citrusy light style, or it could be quite heavy and layered. So it really depends on, on, on the style. There's so huge versatility in the dry wines as well. But again, you know, you can leave your email. And, and you know, let me know what's available in your country, Marion, and I'm happy to recommend some stuff. Uh, so do wineries work on visitors? Which would be among your top five to visit and where should I stay while visiting? Uh, yeah, definitely. They do accept visitors, some more openly than others. Um, so um, some, a lot of wineries, you can actually just walk in. If you're, for example, if you're in MAD, uh, which is one of the main villages in the region. You can just walk around and go to a lot of places and you don't need to make a reservation, but I would definitely recommend to, you know, just to check if they're gonna be there. And, um, and a lot of wineries actually provide sort of um, walks around the winery and it's better to, if, if you register, but definitely I would um, recommend uh, from MAD, but Royal Tokai or Remus, they're quite open as well. Um, um, good question. Kirai Udvar, you could try. Um, yeah, I mean, some, is, uh, some are uh, more difficult than, than others for sure. Um, Gosh, you caught me, caught me out there. I, there, there are there are loads, loads of wineries. Lankei, I think they they also accept visitors. Um, Bartopinta, they're great to visit. They're they're quite open. You know, they have different lines, flights that you can try. But yeah, again, if you're planning to visit Tokai, any of you who took part today, just just send, drop me an email, and you know, I I can help you out. Um, can you repeat the percentages about dry, sweet, etc.? Uh, so generally, uh, about sort of seventy-five percent of the current wine uh, production in Tokai is um, like semi-sweet wine, and uh, dry and sweet. So dry is would be about twenty percent, roughly. Again, these are not. These are just information that I am um, extracted from wineries and winemakers. So there, there isn't, um, you know, a statistic that I can refer to, uh, but 5% of the total uh, wine uh, production is, is Asu. And then 75, <laughs> yeah, that doesn't really, so it's like about 15% is basically all the sweet styles and, uh, 
probably then the 20% dry is slightly overestimated. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite difficult to get these numbers, but the majority is, is a semi-sweet semi style and only 15% of the total production is Samorodni, Osu, and, um, and the traditional uh, sweet styles. <laughs>